You are listening to the GAA Hour brought to you by Sports Joe and Shore. 72 hour non stop protection, tested to the limits. Shore, it won't let you down. Hello, everyone. You're all very welcome to the show brought to you by Sports Joe and Shore. 72 hour protection. Myself and Lee Costello are both here, as usual, and uh, we're joined today by Galway footballer uh, Shane Walsh. Shane, um, how's things? Uh, disappointing ending yesterday, obviously, but uh, how, how are you today? I uh, look, like any game, you have to review things, see where things went wrong, I suppose, first on the day. And look, within the day, it was, there was a point in it yesterday, and yeah, games can go like that. We've had a couple of games like that last year that went our way, and unfortunately yesterday... It just we were on the wrong end of it. We're been on the right end of it before. It was it was wild for a finish. The the whole game like a draw game. Galway kind of pushing for the for the last score. Peter Cook kicks the ball out, bounces over the head. It's the crowd are roaring. Um, Mernon wins his free. It's a draw. It's a Armar one up, and then it comes down the other end and. Kier McGinney's going mad. The stands are roaring. Everything is kind of going a small bit mad in the whole um, in the whole pitch, and you get the free. You're waiting for ages, so it just it just went. Um, I suppose it's it's. Do you remember much of it there for a finish? Ah, look, these they, these are the kind of moments in games that just they come about. I suppose, John, that's what people want to see as well. In that they things get tense towards the end of a game, and that. So, uh, yeah, look, it's. Um, you know, obviously, if he was there to be taken, and unfortunately, I didn't execute it, and that's down to me alone, I suppose, in that regard. But look, it's it's a game of football at the end of the day, and we have to pick ourselves up. We've next week to look forward to again. We're still in the championship. It's very rare you lose a championship game and you're still there. So we have that to look forward to, and yeah, we just have to plow on now. Yeah, I suppose that's the I suppose the saving grace for you is that unlike John Heslin, they Westmead, they he missed the free and they were knocked out of the championship. You've you know you've you have a time to get over it and you have very little time to, you know, you have, you have a match in six days' time, so it's... Uh, it's yeah, a yeah, exactly. Look, chance to redeem, <laughs> I suppose, ch- chance to redeem myself firstly, but I know the lads as well will be the same boat as well and everyone just is going to row in to, to get a result next weekend. Um, I suppose, like, that's the... Like, it's, it comes around so quick. Um, is it just, yeah, you just try and forget about it, think about the next game. The minute you even get into the, to the dressing room, like, you're probably... Because you probably weren't expecting to be playing... In, in six days time that is it just all focused on right how do we get right now for, for the for the next weekend yeah they, well no I think it, you plan for every eventuality like that's part of the management that's what they've been good at doing all the way along like no matter what way Anthem is going to fall you're just prepared for any eventuality and like we were fully prepared that we could be finishing even third yesterday if results had went uh, a different way so look that's that's just it but positive is I suppose we have a home draw in, in Pierce Stadium which you know, it's a huge boost. You're back in front of your own supporters again, and yeah, just have to get back on the horse now. Just kind of said, review the game yesterday, get bodies right, and get ready to go again. So, what is it like um, when we you realise, I suppose, after the match yesterday, that you know we're 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 straight back on the horse. We have a match next week. Um, are you thinking about like you know recovery straight away on the Sunday night? Is it an ice bath last night, or is it? Is it stuff like that? Yeah, no, there is. Like, I suppose even the, a swim today, little things like that, that that's like it's, it comes down to small percentages now and who does the best in this kind of time frame that's there because, you know, the window is so short. But, like, I suppose the National League kind of gives you the resemblance of what it is like now where you have, you know, a couple of games in a short space of time. And it's great in one way, but obviously you have to be mindful of where bodies are at and trying to manage players' loads and that. So that's the big thing at the moment that obviously we're trying to get right um, for next weekend so yeah you kind of have a good template built up from the National League I suppose the thing about um, the GA is it's, it's amateur players and you're back to work um, the next day that's, that's why we have you, you in here today you were, you were doing the, the first day of the upskill camps in, um, in Kilmacud Croke so um, how how did that go go this morning? Yeah, no, it was brilliant. In fairness, it was lovely to see. There was like a lot of different uh, club players there, so it wasn't both boys and girls. Like so, you know, we had uh, Paddy Munn. There was Clan Tariff, you know, that came down town from the north side, and obviously Kilmacud, Ballantyre. There was lots of clubs around the area there, like that as well, that were all participating today. So no, it was brilliant, a brilliant first day there. So it was in uh, in over there in uh, Silver Park, but uh, yeah, it's very enjoyable. Like in, I think it's a big window for me. To kind of, I suppose, give my knowledge, I suppose, of from an inter county experience to young players that are, I suppose, are aspiring to play for their counties down the line in both the women's and men's codes. So, like, 
there I think after cool camps I think there's probably not a huge window there in regards to unless you make an under 14 or 16 development squads at the county like outside of that there isn't really much for them and for me it's just a chance to probably give back something that I've picked up over time and if I can help um, the next generation I suppose to get to that level I said it wouldn't be great so you're in you're a PE teacher um, yourself and you're I know from talking to you before that coaching is something that you've you've always enjoyed and had a had an interest in yeah no yeah I suppose yeah I'm teaching there at the Rest of Abbey and Dalky there and you know, yeah we even got the GA we had a good GA team there going this year especially in our first years and we're just trying to build it through as well like but yeah no these, it's a huge passion I suppose and even like the greatest satisfaction for me is to see is to work with somebody and to see somebody improve and you know, to think that you could have an influence on that person to help them improve and help their skill base do you know like that's that's all I'm trying to do and like it's what was I suppose bestowed on me when I was younger with my principal back in national school like the, the work that he did with me back in the day like that helped me in regards to making my goal of playing with Goy at, at senior level so like if I could do that for the kids ne- the next generation like wouldn't it be brilliant to be able to transfer I suppose what I learned onto them and hopefully bring them to the next level so what, what, what was your experience sorry on underage and getting into Galway did you play for development teams growing up I actually didn't we were, we were just chatting about it the way uh, to the game yesterday myself and Berkey like this uh, he he was he was on every uh, underage squad up until senior level I suppose and whereas I didn't make it until I was in my last year minor so um, it was kind of a slow process like there was days there I remember the Ted Webb when they picked it used to be split city and west and north kind of county Galway and um, we had I think 30 players yeah there was 30 players picked on both sides and like I wasn't one of those 30 players so like you're kind of going home that night obviously upset <coughs> sorry there um, you're obviously going home a bit upset and you're there thinking like I'm Joe am I really good enough for that Joe and it's kind of a hard place but I suppose at the same time I had to go back into the go back into myself a bit and say Joe you know, like I had to kind of develop that self belief that like all the time I spend outside practicing playing like I have to be able to bring that to the table I have to show them that you know they're essentially wrong that I should be there but you know it took time and yeah it's, it's like part I suppose part of the process for me that probably helped me develop that kind of mental resolve to kind of take those tough experiences and just bring it forward and you know use it as a lesson rather than using it as a hindrance to me going forward and like it's the very same as yesterday like it, as I said like I'm never afraid I've been putting myself out there in moments that things can go wrong for you and on the biggest stage and that happens and you just have to learn from it bring it forward and, and try and change that the next day and that's the way it is and, and do you think because there's a lot of talk about development teams and what age is the best age to actually start bringing you know young players on, is it an under 14 team is that even too young under 16 team playing at county level some are saying that it's like divisive in the sense that it actually discourages people from playing football and, and you know keeping the sport up because they get dispirited obviously you took it the other way it made you more resilient is that really what you're trying to do you're trying to catch them people that you know, maybe just missed out. Yeah, exactly. I, well, I just think like, and even, look for for everyone that age group, like, because there's so much to learn. You know, as you're growing up, like, you you won't be ticking every single box because there's some areas you'll be stronger, and when you bring that to the table, like, it it'll get you to that level. But maybe in a couple of years' time, if you're already strong in areas and you haven't brought the other ones along, you tend to see players fall away. And like, I've seen that people, like, even we said. I'm saying yesterday, like there was one player. Ian's the only player from our that Ted Webb team under 16 level that's still playing for going out. Like, do you know, you're talking about 30 players. One player is playing for going out. Yeah. Versus, do you know, so like that's what you're kind of looking at is that that window there that I suppose a lot of players fall off. So can you bring I suppose more, give them more tools to their armory? So you know, like there's already kids there that are very talented in certain areas of their game, and it's like how can you bring more to them? So be it if it's tactical awareness, if it's spatial awareness, if it's doing you know, that speed of thought, speed of movement, they're the kind of little things that I'm trying to bring in. You're trying to bring it in a in a full and element way because, like, do you know, inter county level and especially even the development squads, it's quite competitive. Whereas this, you're not. It's not an overly competitive environment, but you're competing with yourself, obviously, because you know, I'm, I suppose, challenging kids in different ways and how to improve. But you're at the same time they don't feel like as in if I don't it's it's the end of the world you know like I said like that kind of feeling I had when I was in Ted Webb when I didn't make that squad it nearly felt like the end of the world but like I look enough for me I had enough to go home and be kicking up against the wall and practicing myself in that regard and you know I suppose the power of imagination was a big thing for me that I was able to picture myself in these scenarios of playing the intercounty games and being you know nearly playing the All Ireland. In Crow Park, back in the home in in Clamber, and you know that was that was the kind of way for me to develop. But 
you know, some kids mightn't have that and you're just trying to bridge that gap for them. It's funny, isn't it, when you're under 16 and you're looking at the boys in the county team, like you were looking at Ian Burke there, you think this is like the biggest thing in yeah. the world and this is, you know, these boys are the best and that's just in your head um, from a young age. You, ca- you mentioned that like when you were that age, it was, it was in your head that you wanted to bounce back straight away, prove these people wrong. Like, is that still a kind of an attitude that you'd have in your career now? Like if someone, you know, if you're criticised, whether it's missing a free, having a bad day, like missing the free yesterday, is it something that's in your head? Do you know, I yeah. have to prove people wrong again. Like, yeah, it's definitely like as in, I suppose I'm never someone that kind of moves forward while looking in in the the rearview mirror. But at the same time, like obviously you're only as good as your last day out, and do you know that's probably something that was bred into me by mum and dad when I was younger. So like that's essentially where where my starting base is, and it's probably not the starting best starting place to be this week. But at the same time, I can things can only get better. Do you know, so that's that's where I kind of look at things. But look, there's work for me to do, and that's the way it has to be. And a lot of it this week is going to be around recovery. Recovery, mm-hmm. getting yourself ready for a game, you know. So that's that's the nuts and bolts with like, and yeah, ha- I think you, like for me, I think that's what's worked best for me my whole career is that you're kind of taking each game because I don't want to be living off a moment or a thing from before because it's gone. Like you know, it's a sin- essentially you now that's a memory, and I'll reflect on that in twenty years time when I'm finished playing, but I'm not going to be reflecting on it next Tuesday night thinking about a couple of years ago Mm -hmm. you know it's it's nice that it's there but that's it It, you have to move forward because there's good days and bad days you've left behind you it it had to be Mayo this morning didn't it (laughs) yeah ah, look it's it seems to always be the case like but sure look it's we know each other so well at this stage it's you know it there's nothing there's nothing new no one's going to throw nothing new at it and uh it's just going to be a case of who comes out on top and the games the last couple of years even you saw like this year even there was a draw there was a uh, result that didn't go for us we the result that went for us last year look who knows what way it's going to go but we we've worked to do ourselves and i'm sure they do as well after the after losing to cork yesterday so um but yeah we just have to work on ourselves now um, just getting back to the camps, so it's Kilmacud this week from Monday to Thursday. That's the plan for the for the next. It's six or seven weeks. Six, you're doing, six weeks, and yeah. You're, you're going all over the country. You're going from yes. Kilmacud to Cork to Donegal to, and it's all. There's another one in there as well. Yeah. It? So I've I've uh, I suppose in Dublin I've Kilmacud in Cork I'm down in Clannacilty. Then I'm back up to Kildare. I'm in Sarsfields there. Then I'm up in Donegal. I'm in Letterkenny there. Uh, then I'm in over to our neighbours Mayo in uh, Castlebar and then finishing up uh, in my home club then in Clamber and then in Galway So nice symmetry I suppose to to end up back back there Yeah exactly yeah sure that's 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 where it all began I suppose for me as well so it's uh, yeah just nice to kind of have those home roots touching on those as well but uh, yeah it's just it gives you great I suppose it gives me a chance to meet all kinds of players and like you know for me I learn things from players and what's you know the biggest thing is that especially even from teaching in secondary school a lot of these kids are that, that age group as well so you kind of learn to build a bond with them as well and be able to kind of connect and I learn from them as much as they learn from me so that's the kind of way I want to learn because I want to be the best coach that I can possibly be and like you're not going to know that by kind of talking down to uh, kids all the time you, like, you, you have to work with them see what works best for them and you're, you know, you're just trying to probe find different opportunities and what is the best way to maybe portray a drill because just because it's good for one person doesn't mean it's good for the next and like the best coaches will be able to manoeuvre around or find a way to connect with that age group and with those kind of players to be able to get everyone onto that same page. So you're looking forward to the, uh, I suppose it's going to be running throughout this, the summer really and you'll be, you'll be, you'll be all over the place, all over the, the country but um, I suppose you got a taste, taste for it this morning, yeah, you enjoyed the, the start anyway? Yeah, no it is, yeah, look the, the talent that's out there, like it, it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to see you, like I think there's a lot of players there that are probably playing at a higher level than I was at that age group, like it's very hard, I don't think there's any footage of me playing at that age, but uh, there's some there, like especially when you see the, like I'd be a big advocate of the bilateral skills, from left foot, right foot and left hand, right hand and like seeing some of the skills there, like you can see it's been bred into people by their underage coaches that you can see where lads are really taking on board and girls and they're actually able to use the right and left foot probably a lot more than a lot of players even now at, at inter-county level, you know, so like if that is the level you're working off, like inter-county football is going to be in a good place. Some people, like they maybe when they're finished training themselves, they like to get a break from, I know there's a few lads in our club team, you know, they say they're not going to get into the coaching because they like to take a break themselves and they'll have enough time for coaching when they're, when they're finished, but you don't, um, you don't feel like there's ever too much going on, you kind of, you just you have a love for it. Ah, uh, yeah. Though I think definitely not from a coaching perspective. Playing probably is slightly different. Like the split season is 
quite demanding when you're kind of going to the to the pinnacle of, of both seasons. You 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 literally don't have a break. Whereas like you know from a collective like you're you're all in for that hour or two. But like uh, for me, the recovery is quite simple. Whereas when you're playing, your recovery is quite like a lot more physical as well as mental. Like as Joe, you know, when you're coaching, you are, there is a certain element to you demanding. But like you're having to run around for ten k or you know whatever in the session, and you're not, you know. I suppose beating the weather, whatever it is, you know, then you you have that kind of difference as regards the recovery is slightly different. You're resting your mind rather than in training. You're probably resting your mind and your your body because depending on how training goes, some days training can go very well for you, and the mental side is a lot easier to recover than the 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 other side. Whereas sometimes training doesn't go for well for you or games don't go well for you, and you have to recover uh, psychologically as well. Like and but that's that's the beauty of the game, isn't it? Definitely. Um, you mentioned kind of the different skills, like the. Whether it's changing the hands or if they see you sometimes you're kicking up with your left foot and catching it in the right hand, different skills like this. Like when you're going into coaching, um, like do you, do you, would you be watching different players and seeing what they do and seeing, thinking like whether it's a Rian O'Neill or a David Clifford, how, how can I teach a young lad or a young girl how, how to do what these boys do? Would you look at players kind of like that yourself? Yeah, no, you do, like I suppose, because again, it all depends on what ma- the player is comfortable with as well, because like, you know, I've learned a certain style and that's that's my style. It doesn't mean it's the exact same style. You have the, I suppose, the principles of the you know, your left foot, right foot, as regards a lot of people go left hand, uh, left foot, right hand, right foot. And you'll see a lot of people when they start off kicking off their weaker side, they, if they're right footed, they, like the right hand when they're trying to kick off the left hand foot they start bringing the right hand across and like straight away you're trying to explain the whole balance side of things that like you lose your balance when you're starting to lean over across your body and someone comes to tackle you you're very easy to pull off kicking the ball so like from that perspective you're it's very easy for me to come in and kind of change that sort of thing whereas you know, it just all depends on the different techniques some people use kicking the ball because like like every person here like us three here we're all unique in their own uh, in their own way. So you're just trying to find that spot. And for me, it's recognizing, I suppose, what way they're kicking the ball and how can you adjust their kicking by, you know, I suppose, what influence I can have in their kicking to make it more successful for them the way they are, the way they have it already. And like that's that's what I'm trying to do, and that's what I've had happen to me when I was younger. And then just trying to see can I bring that across. And like some players, then like you'll meet different players that'll be kind of maybe based off a higher level, and you might try the bilateral where they're all on right right hand uh, left foot do you know I, I am, I'm a big fan of that one um, in the last probably three or four years I've seen especially like Dave Clifford be your obvious example where he uses it because it allows you to scan allows you to hold the player off the scenario as well so like there's all benefits of that but like that comes from a lot of work done with your the skill set already in regards to being able to left hand left foot he's now you know again developed that skill set where he's so confident with the soul and the ball that it's able to I suppose survey what's what's around and like the more time you can create yourself in the ball the more dangerous you become in that football field and there's no better skill in the game than kicking off both sides to be able to get that time yeah, and then just how much uh, like in terms of coaching does the psychological elements ever come into it because you know what it's like if you kick three points early on in a game suddenly you feel on fire and then you can't miss but what if you miss maybe the first two your whole game's off even though you feel like you're doing everything is exactly the same as you'd always do the skills are still there but because it's in the back of your head and you hear about all these County players, they talk about like triggers and resets. Is coaching a young age, is it too young to get into even that? Or is that something you explore with your coaching? I think it's just the cues, like the positive affirmation, I think is a big one for me with the, with kids, especially because like, you know, even like you, like if someone misses a shot, like straight away, like you don't need to, it's like making a mistake. No one needs to tell you about making a mistake. You'll know it yourself. So for me, like when you see uh, um, a kid making a mistake, then like you're literally saying the next ball they get, they might just catch a ball and hand pass it two yards to somebody. But straight away, you, you connect with them, make, like, you know, call them the name, whatever it is, Joe Bloggs, well done, great pass. Next day, all of a sudden, you can see that their chest just starts to open again, and they start saying, "Oh yeah, like I, you know, I did something good, you know." Whereas, if straight away, if, if they made another mistake, you're kind of saying, Geez, "Do you know, like rather than going after them and saying mm-hmm. you made a mistake, like what's the first thing that's in their head? It's that mistake." Do you know, yeah. they're literally thinking, and you're starting to get a player nervous. Whereas, if you go and give that person that bit of confidence, next ball, even like I know uh, Divo would be a big advocate of next ball, next ball, next ball, because like as I said earlier, like it's like driving with your in your rear view mirror like you can't be looking back at the mistakes so like let's focus on the next one make the next play a positive play and like be it a two yard hand pass 50 yard kick pass whatever it is once it's a positive play and obviously the more shorter ones are probably safer but again making that positive play helps build that confidence again because 
Joe, there is mistakes, but football is littered in mistakes. Like it's people can live off turnovers all they want. They're going to happen. They're continuously going to happen. It's what makes the game exciting as well. So like for me, it's just how you respond to that and like those little things. I think that big thing is positive affirmation after mistake to to encourage the next play to be a good play rather than saying why did you give that ball away to X Y and Z. You know, so mm-hmm. no one intends to go out and make a mistake. You know, it happens. So how do we react to it? Exactly. And then just you mentioned their confidence. I think everyone can or it'd be fair to say that you're a very confident player you know you want to stand up and name clutch moments and the all Ireland final last year is probably the best example of it but was that always in you or you know was that something you worked on did you ever not have confidence and it started start, slowly started to come in you know like was it just is that something you developed over time were you even aware of it uh, look there, there's times I suppose it's there's times where, when things come, come hard to you and there's like there's times where you will doubt yourself. Like I'm sure every player is probably going through those moments, and you're trying to showcase that. Uh, the, I suppose the br- the the bravado side in you as well to like because you know you don't want to give a sign of weakness to anyone either. So I think like there is. I think it's important to have those moments as well because you learn from them. Do you know because there's no point in thinking you're do you know that the the sh- sun shines from everywhere from you. Like it's that's not the reality of it. Like there's days when things just don't go for you. So it's just all about picking yourself up and how do you do that how do you respond to these things and to a lot of it is like your mental preparation as well and how you mentally prepare for these things and I suppose I have always I suppose in part of my process of visualisation you visualise things going wrong as much as you visualise things going well because you have to be ready for all outcomes because look on a given day things just I said it's like a penalty you miss you know keep your guess the right way you might miss the target you just have to respond again go again go again go again like that's that's the way it is because again there's no point sitting there thinking should have went this way should have went that way you have to move forward with it and that's probably the big thing that's probably I think that builds your confidence as well because you're saying well I know this could happen so you know let's go again let's keep going do you know that's that's the way it is like and you have to keep going to your last breath and Whoever does it the best and whoever does it for the longest will probably come out on top inevitably. Yeah, I'm so pumped now. now. <laughs> yeah. just, I'm 30 nearly and I feel like I can make county now. Just <laughs> <laughs> like whenever it does go wrong, is it is there something like, you know, I'll, I'll get myself back into the game now. I'll do something, maybe do the, the simple thing rather than complicating it. Just trying to, you know, just play, your, play yourself back into the game if something does go against you. Yeah, like that's that's essentially what your your first play is is trying to be kind of saying right, like let's let's correct that play, like you know, because like you know the last thing you want to be doing is is to be trying maybe too hard in regards to what your next kind of thing is, like because you know just because you missed an opportunity doesn't mean the next play has to be like you're not going to get double the reward for it. You know, if you miss a goal chance, you're not going to get double the reward for trying even harder to get that goal chance again. Like you have to just take the next play as it is and say, what is the best thing I can do in this play? And look, if it's a goal chance again, try and take your goal chance. But if it's a point chance, take your point. If it's just that pass to set somebody else up for a score, because straight away, like at the end of the day, it's not about me. It's not about... Uh, you know, any V2 when you're playing it's about the whole team and if you can work towards that because like the biggest thing you'll get from even I've seen it from my own players is that when you make a positive contribution to someone they'll give you that bit of confidence then as well say oh like, well done great pass you know and next thing straight away again like and that, that effect I think I said it about kids like it has an effect on adults as well because when you hear that positive affirmation from your teammates who you train week in week out with like straight away that gives you that bit of confidence to say Geez, yeah, no, I feel, you know, I feel I'm starting to, you know, feeling, feeling myself back into the game again, and you start to relax in because the last thing you want, the last thing you need, I suppose, is, especially you see it from opposition teams, they'll be trying to remind you of it all the time of the mistakes you make. Whereas you probably need your teammates more than ever then to be picking you up and kind of, you know, encouraging you for the next play again. Definitely. Um, just you, you mentioned earlier, like how quick you have to kind of bounce back, and I suppose it's never been quicker than this year with the. The way it is with the the system that it's nearly playing every week or every second week, and Everton is going so quick. Um, have you enjoyed that? I suppose it's the first um, year of this series, say, and I'd say your group with Armagh, Tyrone, Westmead was probably the most um, entertaining of all the groups, nearly. So, how, did you enjoy as a player playing in that setup? <laughs> funny time to be asking me, but uh, yeah, it's it's probably a funny one. Like uh, I just think the the way the schedule of the whole thing is like it's it's so condensed in a short period of time that like the one aspect I, I just fear for is players that pick up the injuries in the time frame and because that they could miss like if someone got injured in that first game or the week before that 
all of a sudden they're going to miss out on that whole block and their team could be knocked out in the space of three weeks and you're saying like your year could be over after and it could be just a simple simple injury that someone gets but because of the time frame that we're trying to run it in mm. it's it, like that's the only thing I probably don't like about the the way things are going at the moment it's just everything is on such a tight uh, time frame and like players push nine ten months of the year behind every year that goes in there like you know I know it from experience I see it from other lads there and like some lads their whole lives are on hold for these moments and it can just be gone in the blink of an eye and I know look someone can injure a week out from an all Ireland final and that can happen too but like you generally will get the most of the year whereas literally the year nearly starts when this group starts and it could be gone in the blink of an eye mm. you know so that's the only side of it but yeah look obviously as players you love playing you, <laughs> playing games beats training you know like that. so that's the other positive for the next weekend is that we have a game rather than training definitely um yeah, well, look, um, brilliant to hear about the the ups, upskill camps, and there's more information on that on upskill camps. Um, Shane Wall study, isn't it? Is, yeah, is yeah, it's upskill camp study. Yeah, upskill camp study, and uh, I'm sure you'll be you'll be kept busy, and a lot of kids around the country they'll be uh, loving that over the next few weeks. And sure, you'll be back um, playing again, whether it's Saturday and Sunday, and uh, Saturday or Sunday against Mayo. So uh, the best look with that as well, Shane. And thanks for coming in. Cheers, that's thanks. So now we're going to head to our uh, weekly stats quiz, which uh, comes up in partnership with our friends at Shure, official statistic partners of the GA, uh, where we look at the most eye-catching stats from the championship weekend. Um, last week's winner was Conor O'Dwyer, who um, got the question right that TJ Reid had won his 12th, a remarkable 12th Leinster championship with Kilkenny. Um, so... Which brings us on to this week's question, which is, it stems from Colm Collins' um, departure as Clare manager. Colm was the longest serving inter-county manager in the GA. So, um, who, who is the longest serving inter-county manager in the GA now? Um, so, it's up to you, our audience. Give us the answer to this stat-related question on our social media to begin with a chance of winning a sure-themed prize. And the winner will be announced on the show next week. Okay, so we're back and we're back to talk a little bit about Tyrone Lee. Um, it's, uh, she's, I don't know, are you, you're happy, I suppose, that they're true? Probably not um, overly happy with the performance, um, but yeah, are they on borrowed time in this championship, Lee? Yeah, that, that seems to be the best way to, to, to feel it up. As a Tyrone fan, like it does feel like borrowed time. There's still always that hope that they'll get a kick and the new format sort of allows you to do that. I do get a little bit hopeful, because like, we've been saying all season that Armagh could get a kick, Cork could get a kick, Kildare could get a kick. You know, and they all have potential and we're sort of bored, stupid saying it. And then in one weekend, they all did. You know, they all mustered up uh, all of their ability and, and the, everything just clicked. So I'm still like slightly hopeful that this extra week is all Tyrone need. There were some positives. Um, I mean, mostly disappointment, but there were some positives. And the obvious one being Dark Canavan kicking 10 points, but just genuinely being outrageous. Like, you know, him on the ball is, is, is genuinely, it's like a beautiful thing to watch. Um, another positive was Kieran McGeary uh, came off the bench. That's the best I've seen him play. And you know, in a good way, obviously, 2021 Player of the Year. He's just sort of been struggling for form since that. He came on, had a really good point, uh, started winning some breaking balls, and that's always what his main strength has been. He's the sort of man that would put his head where he wouldn't put a boot, you know, like uh, and balls that are 60 40 suddenly became Tyrone balls when Kieran McGeary's about. So maybe he'll get to start next week and that'll add that bit of power uh, into the half forward line. Dar McCurry was injured. If he's back for Donegal, I feel a lot more optimistic. Obviously, Donegal are going to be looking at Canavan thinking we need to shut him down. But if McCurry's on the field as well, he's not exactly someone you can let, you know, just do what he likes and roam around. So I don't know where to stand with Tyrone. It's just been the theme of the season. Uh, the Donegal game, hopefully, tell, well, they'll tell you everything because they'll either be out if they don't stand up. And Donegal are definitely a team actually on the up, not something I thought I'd be saying two weeks ago, hmm. but they're in a much better place. So, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of with the team at the weekend that teams are just, the team of the year, team, some teams are turning around from, yeah. from terrible situations. You mentioned um, Derek Hanavan there, and I know we, we all knew that he was class, um, I suppose, since he was a teenager. I remember him scoring for the Tyrone Miners, that unbelievable goal he scored that day. But this year, even above, even last year and above any year, you're seeing a bit of a fire in him. And mm -hmm. I, was, I only seen the Tyrone game on the, the Sunday game, but he came across um, Kevin Maguire at one stage, the Westmead fullback, and he just, it was after Maguire was hanging out with him. Yeah. Do you remember that for the score? Yeah. And Canavan just comes in, and this is a big man, and Canavan comes in and gives him a shoulder, like, yeah. like do you know, 
You, you uh, tried everything, but I, you couldn't stop me. He's, he's a new he's a new man this year. Oh, no, absolutely. I'd say the big thing, genuinely, is that he's got a really long run of games now because ever since there's almost been a rush to get him involved into the Tyrone team, as you know, as young as he, he could possibly be, and he's been picking up injuries on and off, and Mickey Hart's first year when they brought him on, he was always carrying like a niggle. He didn't actually be involved in the 2021 campaign until, I think, the semi-final because just just the nature of the injuries. So this feels like the first time he's just got the whole league under his belt, loads of football at this level, and he's just fit, he's ready, and he can totally free to express himself. And you mentioned Kevin Maguire there, and that man will never want to see Dory Canavan again. It was, it was strange that they didn't change the matchup. And then another positive of that too is that Rory Canavan got his first start for Tyrone. He's lined out at half four, but he really played as a corner forward. He got three points from play. You know, the, the big problem with Drone is obviously not getting scores. So having Dara stand up on that occasion, Dara McCray to come back up. Hopefully, Rory's now involved and, the, you know, he can handle the pressure and stuff because he's such a, at a young age, too. But yeah, I mean, when you've got players like that, it's hard. That's why you can never rule Drone out, you know, when you've got talent like that. It's like when Kerry are at their absolute worst and they've got Clifford. And I know I'm jumping the gun there comparing the two, but it, that's just how special this kid is, you know, his young age and the fact that he can step up like that. And I'd say he got a, a really good apprenticeship growing up in Tyrone, them um, boys digging into him and telling them who his dad is and why he won't be as good. So he'll always have a bit of bite about him. You must have been a nervous man when John Heslin stood over oh, that free. Stop. I uh, have <laughs> no words I'm allowed to say on a podcast, I don't think. I was like, I can't believe it, we're going out to this championship. Because genuinely, that wasn't the fear going into the game. Like, I never really thought, like, I assumed Galway would probably get the win over Armagh, in that sense anyway. And then I did think that, and, and in the game too, like, I always believed that Westmeath would put it up to Tyrone. I never thought Tyrone were going to go. I seen the bookies had, like, an eight points difference. They thought the game was going to be, I Westmead never put thought it up that. to everyone in Every, that group, exactly. even Galway. And yeah. I know Galway pulled away, but Westmeath, they were... You know, they were a match for them all. Exactly. So the evidence would suggest that it was going to be a tight game. I just thought Tyrone had the more know-how at this level and, you know, the experience. Um, so for it to, to end up was a draw and really, you know, you would have put your house in John Heslin to, to score that because he was brilliant all day and he's been brilliant all season. That Westmead team, Luke Lachlan, um, Raikland Allen, oh, Ronan O'Toole, that man is just, he could he's play plenty. in any county team. Genuinely, he was a nightmare uh, for Tyrone to mark. So... I, I genuinely still I feel bad for Westmead because it sort of feels like they deserve to go through. Um, we'll leave Tyrone there. Yeah. We'll, you'll be hoping <laughs> that more talk throughout the summer. Um, it's coming up quick next weekend against Donegal, so time will tell about that one. The game I wanted to talk about most um, coming in here today it was uh, Kildare and Roscommon. Kildare won 16, Roscommon won 15. Um, I suppose it was a bit of a surprise to a lot of people that Kildare won. Like we, We'd been giving out about them um, in a specific podcast earlier in the year, we we called we called them the Spurs. Uh, well, it was actually Kyle Coney that yeah, called it was, them it was the Spurs. His fault Spurs, the GA. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people would have agreed with it at the time. And if they are the Spurs uh, of the GA, this was their win over Ajax in the Champions League semi final. <laughs> it was, it was, and you, you, I could just watching it, you could get a sense from Glenn Ryan in in the interview that you know there was something brewing, um, a small bit before the game, like he was. He was saying, you know, hopefully this is the day now. Like, I'm, you know, the main disappointment has been that we just haven't been delivering um, what we've been showing on, on the training field. And from the very start, like they started that goal, Alex Burns' goal was, I, I actually jumped up out of the couch watching it. It was one of the best goals um, I've seen def definitely this year. Um, but Kildare, they just had a, they, you know, they had a bit of a, they had a bite about them and yeah. they had... Started like trains. Um, the game was the game was unbelievable. I mean, I suppose it was the added excitement with Davy Burke being a Kildare man um, on the Roscommon sideline. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it when uh, Kildare they started so well, and then uh, they got the two black cards. So Ryan Hulahan and uh, Alex Byrne got black carded, and as soon as um, Hulahan got black carded, Kildare taking their kick out for the the next play, and Shea Ryan the fullback, and another lad. It showed it from the the, the yeah. camera from a good bit far away, and the two boys just go down. Absolutely nothing yeah. wrong with them, <laughs> like nothing at all. They just went down holding their heads. The ref, in fairness, to him, he was very sharp. He came over and yeah. booked Shea Ryan, and then on the sideline you had the two boys. Um, Davy Burke was. He, it was actually, you know that meme of Jose Mourinho where his Tottenham assistant comes over and tells him, like, you should be getting mad about this. Oh, yeah, and, and he Mourinho sprints. jumps out yeah. of the dugout. 
uh, it was the exact same as that. I think it was Mark McHugh beside yeah. David Burke and he's there tapping him on the shoulder. <laughs> and then David Burke goes mad. He's like, do you know, into Jose Mourinho mode. And then Ale, or Anthony Rainbow is shouting down the line at him yeah. like, uh, uh, looked like, like profanity. Stuff, so like, it was, yeah. just, it was uh, so, so exciting now. No, it was brilliant. Like, and, and look, to be totally fair, like, I mean, you can only talk about what you see and I don't think any, anything that we said about Kildare was not true at the time because the evidence was that, the, you know, they have all these brilliant players on paper, all these like superstars, really, and they were dreadful in the league, losing to teams they shouldn't lose to, pulling it off against teams that probably may, we didn't think they were capable of beating, given how they were doing against the other teams. And then the inconsistency is, is it was just, it's almost impressive, to be honest. But uh, when back's against the wall, when there's a bit of jeopardy in the game, you know, they can really pull through. And, and like Ross Common you know, they've been having a brilliant season. Like, they have been consistent, in fairness to them. Um, always raising to the challenge. And, like, there was only a point in it. But, like, that again, that was the theme of the weekend. It was really tight games. It was like, it just felt like championship. First time where it's like, everything's on the line here. So you got to give it everything because there might not be tomorrow. And that brought out the best in Kildare. They just looked a small bit tired, Roscommon. Yeah. Um, and it's not a good sign now that, you know, they have to head out and play next weekend because they just looked like a team... Maybe they thought, you know, you know, David Burke admitted that maybe they thought that we, we'll beat, you know, we've been yeah. better than these all year. We're going to, we might win it handy enough, but they just look tired. And apart from Enda Smith, who, who was, um, he was again unbelievable. And Ben O'Carroll was, was very lively. There was very little else from Roscommon that it just wasn't, um, it wasn't Roscommon that we're used to seeing no. this year. Um, definitely. And I suppose I, I'm a big fan of Davy Barker. He's such a such a straight talker, and he yeah. was interviewed after the game, and you know he was just like, um, not you know we did, they wanted it more. He was so straight up, and you could see how dejected he was. He was actually asked um, before the game. I read this on the Irish Examiner. Did, you know, did it come into his thinking much that you know you're playing against your home county here, Davy? And his quote was, "He didn't give a shite." <laughs> so he he's so he's so straight up, and yeah. uh, really like him. That way, but um, listen, Kildare, what a performance. You mentioned that they have the the talent, like we all know, say the likes of Daniel Flynn. He, he yeah. was he was decent, he was lively. And he was starting again, you because he hadn't yeah. been starting in, in a lot of the championship games, whatever it is about him, the Glenn Ryan, that he doesn't think he's mm. doing enough of. Maybe it's the track and back, you know, he is more of a, he can be a bit mercurial like that, you know. He wasn't like the, it wasn't outstanding from him yesterday, yeah. but he still had such a key key role in bringing the ball out of him. Um, Defence at different times. The two key men for me were were Ben McCormack, just scored yeah. some unbelievable points. This man is gifted. And the two of the ones he scored late on were, you know, they were they were the game changers really because Roscommon were on top and Kildare were, had to work a bit harder for their scores. He scored two unbelievable ones. And of course, Kevin Feely, it was one of the best marks I've ever seen, to be honest, yeah. Lee, the circumstances. Because um, it was a proper mark. Pass, a proper mark. Yeah. Beautiful pass from Daniel Flynn. Um, a tough free. It was like Heslin's. It was like Shane Walsh's one, and he scores it off his bad foot. Yeah. So um, no, incredible, and like, and that's that was like a market like advertisement for what the mark was supposed to be. That's how it was sold to us. What this would bring to the game, it'll bring back the high fetch and full forward. You know, who can um, win the ball with is surrounded by players, and then they get a reward for that just for attempting that, rather than you know trying to break it and get a scramble together and then they've ruined it with this advance mark but that's a whole other podcast yeah it was it was incredible um yeah so just hugely exciting game and um Kildare they've Monaghan next so it's mm -hmm. you know they'll Monaghan will so be, who knows who I knows? mean you couldn't you couldn't possibly be confident that Any team. what team will show up in that match like no. you know because they're both capable but they're both they both have it in their locker too that they can uh, implode so you know, it's definitely entertaining now. You can't say that. It's not entertaining. Yeah, but even the four games that are coming up, um, yeah. it's so hard to predict any of them. You know, I, I, I have no confidence in, in any of them, to be fair. Like, Galway and Mayo going into the draw, I assumed they would have beat whoever they would have got, but then they got each other. So now it's like, you know, one of them has to go out. One of the major favourites for the All-Ireland won't be in the Championship come this day next week and that's just mental to think it's actually an unbelievable draw yeah like they're so um, the teams that got matched against you are the Goblin Mayo like it's toss of a kind yeah. it's Kildare Monaghan toss of a kind Cork Ross Common Donegal Throne like they're so evenly matched I, I could have told you we've got Donegal Throne I just feel like this is the hundredth time in two years <laughs> like that's what it feels like every time Throne have an opportunity to draw someone they draw Donegal and 
oh, I sick of the sight of seeing them. And I thought this year they would maybe disappear, but no, they're back and back in numbers as well. So I'm yeah. fearful. They're quietly building. Like we watched them against Derry. Derry got away from them the last day. Yeah. Um, this day, they can, they just got away from Monaghan, and you know they did a good job in it. Um, I suppose Jack McCarron was was probably earmarked as Monaghan's danger man, given the form he came into this game in. But Brendan McCall did a very good job in keeping him fairly quiet. Um, Monaghan didn't play with the same, I don't know whether it's drive or they didn't seem to have yeah. the same energy about them that we always kind of associate with Monaghan. Um, and Donny Gall kind of, they, they bossed the game. Yeah. Uh, Oshin I mean, Gallen, Conor O'Donnell, Brendan McCall, probably the, the key men. But. Uh, the, the mood in Monaghan was really good after their performance against Derry when they got that draw, but like how much of that was down to the fact that they had time to plan that. You know, they, they probably presumed that Derry were going to win the Ulster Championship. They knew they were going to get them and they were able to, you know, after losing out to them earlier on in the Ulster Championship, they were able to readjust things and revise things. But then suddenly it's a game the next week and then a game the next week, and you know, and you don't get that level of preparation and it's just so much tougher. And we were sort of talking to you about like Conor McManus now does seem he's a player coming from the bench. So like, you know, it's, when, and as a neutral watching Monaghan I just always want to see him on the pitch unless they're playing Tyrone I'm happy enough for him to stay on the bench <laughs> But and that's the same with Jack McCarran you want to see these these players these flair players but hopefully well I don't really I don't have any real invested interest but if this is Connor uh, McManus' last season with Monaghan and I'm not trying to retire them on I just want to see as much of them in the next game as possible you know no more of this springing them off the bench with five minutes to go throw them in yeah you want to see him starting against Kildare yeah and um, this weekend, it's mad that it is this weekend. Even to to say <laughs> that the the players would be all just, I'd say they'd be in ice bats all week. Um, Cork Mayo, another um, wild wild game. I mean, <laughs> Mayo one eleven to they went up one eleven to eight points. And I was watching this. This was at the same time as Calera Scammon, and it was on the GA go. And I was like, right, I'm not even going to look at this game anymore because yeah. this is done. But um, Cork. They're a, they're a new team this year. Uh, I'm yeah. calling them the men with the mullets, uh, Colm O'Callaghan. The bullets with the mullets, actually. Colm <laughs> O'Callaghan in midfield, he is a man, uh, uh, he was on fire yesterday, bombing up and down the field. And you know, it's usually Mayo you associate that kind of running straight down the heart. That's yeah. what they've been doing to teams. But Cork, um, they've been finishing games really well the last few weeks, which is something they hadn't done before. Um, Colm O'Callaghan and Chris Oak jones they're the bullets with the mullets but your man is Stephen Sherlock Lee and he came oh, on and, come on and he changed the game I just think he's unbelievable too Like, and I think it turns out maybe we just weren't giving Cork enough credit for their performance against Kerry so much of that was more built around oh Kerry look flat you know rather than what Cork were doing to them True. you know and then Stephen Sherlock came off the bench that day I think he scored a couple of points and people were like well will he start next time you know they're trying to do this whole have finishers rather than starters and then he came off the bench yesterday Scored 1-5 from the bench. I mean, an absolutely incredible... In a low enough scoring game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like when, when you're thinking about throwing on a player to like, oh, I hope he has an impact in this game, gets a point or a good score. I mean, 1-5, I mean... And, and the game itself, like Mayo, you know, Tommy Conroy came off the bench and he got a goal. And that looked like the goal that was going to kill the game. And I was like, well, this is Mayo all over. They've got more depth in their team. It just makes sense. Cork did really well to stay in the game for this long, but that's probably it. And then I think not a minute later, they get a penalty, convert that, and then they just boss everything. And you mentioned the midfield, the other midfielder there is Ian McGuire. He got man of the match. Anima. Oh my God, they are genuinely. Because I noticed that in the Kerry match too. Like you would never think Cork v Kerry that Cork were going to dominate midfield. And that's what they did, sort of that middle third. Um, they really do have an excellent Spain, you know. Um, is it Kevin Walsh is involved with them now. You know, he has a, his organizational skills are famous, really. So they're genuinely a force to be reckoned with now. And I'd be very surprised now if Stephen Sherratt doesn't start the next match. Again, it's just me, you know, as a football fan. I want to see the best players on the pitch. I want to see the shooters on the field. So hopefully, he gets the nod. Well, um, John Cleary said Stephen is a class player. It's how we use, it's how we can use him, and how he can contribute to the panel and the group. Oh, he's that's not very important. <laughs> he's not starting. Never he mind. Is, he's not starting. <laughs> no, he's nowhere near that team. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you might have to wait until the last twenty minutes. That's it. To see I'll flick um, it over then. Stephen Sherlock, Sherlock again. Um, you mentioned the brilliant uh, record Kevin Walsh has against Mayo, and I think he had a great record for goal against mm -hmm. Mayo. I don't think he's I don't think he's as good a one against um, Roscommon. Mm. They were beaten a few times by Galway in in Connacht final, so that's that'll be another interesting um, 
twist to that one. Um, we'll just give a short mention to the Dublin and Kerry games because they were, um, you know, they were fairly straightforward. They went as you would expect, mm. I would imagine. Um, Desi Farrell said, uh, I suppose, he said after the game that they were delighted to get on the road and I tuned in at the end um, and so was Kieran Kilkenny. And his post-match interview was very funny because... I like the way GA go, they, they work this, um, whether it was the Mayo and Cork match, they had the camera on Michael Meehan and uh, his fellow commentator, I think it was Lee Mahern mm -hmm. up in the commentary box and they were doing the halftime analysis and you know, you don't you don't see that too often. After the Dublin game, they had, uh, they brought Kieran Kilkenny into the dugout mm -hmm. with Grania McIlwain, uh, Michael Murphy and Paddy Andrews and do you know, Kieran was kind of singing off the same hymn sheet as 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 Desi Farrell. He was delighted to get on the road, yeah. um, down to Cavan, um, yesterday, and really enjoyed it. And he gave a few people like shout outs while he was doing the interview. He was in great form now. He was saluting a few people out in the pitch that like they're the Bradys from Cavan. He said, yeah. Um, he did the first question in Irish with um Grania McElwain. And she she's a, a Gaeilgar. She writes for the Irish section, the Irish Independent, but. Um, Paddy Andrews was was getting sick of listening to Kieran, and he went, uh, "Have you anything else to plug before you head off there, Kieran? There's a few um, there's a few more signs in the stand there." And Kieran said, I, "I'm sure you've loads, uh, Paddy, especially with them lovely teeth you have." So, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a, it was a bit of crack at, at the end of that game. They are some nashers. That man went to Turkey, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I suppose Kieran Kenny also said that it's going to be a huge step up for Dublin now um, when is. they get to the to the next round. Well, it's hard, it's hard to read Dublin again because it's, this is the same situation they were in when the Leinster Championship, hammering every team, put in front of them. All oh, bigger tests are coming, but then the bigger bigger test was Sligo. With all respect to them, you know that it wasn't a Division Two, II, Division Three team that they were talking about. And when they did have a real challenge against a Division One team, Ross Common, they struggled. They struggled. It was a draw. So I mean, it's good getting the win, yeah, and getting players into form and kicking points and scores and stuff. But you know. Whoever they get in the draw, like uh, you get, there is always the danger that they'll be caught cold. Definitely is because Roscommon and Derry are probably the two like real top tier teams that they've played this year. Yeah. So um, time will tell. They've 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 another two weeks. Um, Kerry hammered loud. Um, loud haven't had a good season. This a very disappointing end for them. But the. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing that stood out was again David Clifford. He was given the Garda escort off the field when he was taken off. Um, but his finish, did you see the goal? It was unbelievable. He yeah. running in at top speed, um, pure class, and just slotted it real calmly. And um, Peter Canavan was all over it on the Sunday game. It was like a famous one that he scored for Tyrone uh, back in the day. Oh yeah, I mean David Clifford. Like he's not on social media as he, he famously says, but I'd love to know just how famous he is. You know, compared to other Irish stars, because. They, they think he's like a unicorn, you know, the kids when they finally see him and then they have to get a photo of him. You get to get a guard a escort. That, that photo in Sportsfeld was just as magical. Like it really sums up, you know, what a star this kid is and, and just how easily he wears it on his shoulders. Um, I was sort of, maybe I'll, I'll throw this question to you as well. I was just listening to, God, I don't even know what I was listening to that many things on, but they were talking about player of the year so far. I know it's early doors and everything and they all say David Clifford and then I was sort of thinking, Shane McGuigan could maybe, you know, be thrown into that mix. But I'm just wondering where your thoughts would be on that. Um, I was talking about this last night. It's so early to be to be talking it about is, this. It is, it is. Because uh, you can't have a player of the year yet. It, it you, must we, have been, you're not predicting who will get it. You're just saying so far. Yeah. Who do you think um, is in that It must mold? have been Joanne, you were listening. She mentioned at the end of the Roscommon yeah, game that Enda Smith will be up there for player of the year. Yeah. I suppose he'd be up there. David Clifford would uh, be up there. Sean Kelly. What a yeah. player. He was magical, um, yeah. He is, there's definitely a few more um, now that you're putting me on the spot. Stephen Sherlock's probably the super sub of the year. Yeah, is that a role? Um, You'll definitely get that. But yeah, I suppose just before um, we finish up, we have a few shout outs to give. Uh, first is to Libby Coppinger, Cork, a uh, dual player. Um, she played two games on Saturday for the Hurlers, for the Camogie team against Down in Parky Cueve at three o'clock and then up to Pierce Stadium in Salt Hill, three hours up the road to play for the Cork Ladies Footballers against Galway. They were stuck um, with a few injuries. Arla Cahalan broke her foot um, during the week. They got another injury during the game. Um, Aoife Healy went in the car with Libby. She played for the Camogie team as well. Um, didn't come on for the for the football team, but Libby did. So um, just uh, shout out to her. It was unbelievable oh, stuff. Probably stuff, shouldn't, yeah. shouldn't have to be doing that. 
Um, but fair play to her at, at the same time. Obviously, uh, an unbelievable athlete. And on the same subject, uh, James McEntee in the Talchin Cup. So Colin Rourke um, was praising this man in his interview after Meade's uh, 2.23 to 12 defeat of Wexford. James McEntee kicked six of the points and um, Colin says... Uh, it hasn't been easy on him, working as a doctor in Blanchardstown. He worked nights this week. Imagine putting in that performance after working a full shift last night. It's a great credit to him on a personal level. What a man. Unbelievable. Like, I mean, I don't know. I just, it makes me feel guilty about complaining about anything, you know. Um, I mean, that's proper, proper work. And then, he, you know, he obviously was still so on top of as best as he could obviously his recovery and his preparation and to go out and put in a performance and anyone who thought that like maybe me football obviously it's going through a transition they had a really horrible start to the year and it felt like the pride was maybe gone out of the jersey that just goes to show how much it still means to some of those boys and the Talchian Cups obviously being a really good <coughs> format and a really good uh, way for teams like that to you know regain you only have to look at Down and uh, Leash probably you know other teams that are really uh, attacking this tournament and allowing it or give, using it as an opportunity to turn their seasons around and put some pride back in the jersey. Um, so it sets up Meads win sets them up against Antrim now. So yeah. Andy McIntyre, the Antrim manager, they're they're flying as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a four point win over Carlo, and it sets him up. He's against his former count the county he managed last Mead, the county he's from, the county who his son is playing for Shane McIntyre. And James McEntee, as far as I'm aware, is his nephew. So this is going to be next Sunday. and Some awkward dinners in that what house. <laughs> a, what a week for the McEntee family. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And you're thinking, oh, that's sort of a disadvantage because he's got invested interest. And then you're thinking, wait a minute, outside of Colm O'Rourke right now, what other manager in the country knows this Mead team better, you know, in, in terms of uh, weaknesses and strengths? So he'll be able, to, it'll be very interesting to see how he sets up and tries to exploit uh, any information that he has. But yeah, I'm really excited about the Talchin Cup. I think both games are going to be on the Sunday down v Cavan. No, sorry, down beat Cavan. They're playing Leash in the other semi final. Uh, personally, I want to see an all Ulster final. That'd be something pretty cool. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in any of them. It, 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 and again, really hard to tell. Well, I maybe expect down to be Leash, Abad, mm. Antrim, Meath. Meath. Yeah. Yeah. It was another talking point was um, Conor Laverty and you had a piece on this. Uh, oh, yeah. He was interviewed after um, by, it was Damien Lawler on the Saturday game. And Damien was asking about, you know, letting the clubs, the players back to play with their clubs yeah. um, if they haven't played for, for down. Um, and he said, you know, this was something that he would... When he was in the panel, he said he was lucky enough to be starting. Sometimes, sometimes he he wasn't lucky enough to be starting, and he was on the bench. And he said he swore to himself that he'd never hold a player back from from playing with their club. So uh, yeah. that was a nice touch from him. It was well. so good, yeah, that he was so honest with himself in that regard. Because how, well, all, all county managers now had been players at some stage, and I bet when they were players that they didn't agree with that stance. Because I'm yet to meet him a player that like, oh, I totally understand why I'm getting absolutely no football, you know, in terms of club or uh, for county. It just makes so much sense and I suppose he even showed the negative side of that or what the negative possibilities could be because I think it was, was it Ryan McAvoy played for Kilku during the week before a game and he did pick up an injury in that and then so he was ruled out of the down game. I think he's back now anyway but you know that would have been used as well exhibit A where you shouldn't do this but it didn't bother him. He thought well I think, you know, risk reward, the reward's so much greater, keeping players happy, keeping the panel happy. And then when you do have to call on them, you know they've got football, you know, miles in the bank, match experience in recent games, rather than just sort of sitting and decaying on the sub bench, you know, for weeks on end. Yeah, that's his principle and that's what he's going with. So you'd have to um, respect him for that. Just the last shout out is to Colm Collins. He's uh, the parts is the longest serving intercounty manager in the game. And uh, I read a piece uh, wrote by Gary Brennan in the Irish Examiner. So Claire's um, iconic footballer, I suppose, over the, the Colm Collins years. And he just, you know, he paid a, a brilliant tribute to Collins. Um, he said that he was certain that um, some player players wouldn't have answered the call if the call wasn't made by Colin Collins. So it just he was loved by players. Um, and you can see that genuine passion and genuine nature that he has in all his interviews um, it was a great kind of quote he gave at the finish he was like I can watch these boys without the beating of the heart mm-hmm. um, he said for a finish and um, 
There was just one uh, great story in the article. Um, Gary Brennan said that, uh, do you know, he do, do, there was nothing, no job beneath him for that was for the good of Clare football. So he remembers one time um, when there was the Clare supporters club or football supporters were doing a raffle draw. And um, it was during a, a heat wave when they were the raffle was for a car. And he said that uh, he saw Colin Collins driving the car up and parking outside one of the main hotels in, in, in Clare. Uh, so more people would buy because the, the place was busy on that day. Mm-hmm. So more people would buy tickets uh, for the draw. So, <laughs> you know, uh, I suppose it just sums him up as, as a man. And uh, a great way to, I suppose, sign off the show because he's been a great servant for Clare and... Um, do you know, an, an unbelievable manager. I think a, a lad we'd, uh, everyone, every one of his players seemed to love. Owen mm. Cleary's tribute to him was, was brilliant as well. We, we, don't, we don't play for Clare, we play for we're Colin Collins, was how he put it. Um, so that was uh, unbelievable. And look, uh, there's loads to come um, next week. It's all kicking off. There's nearly too many games to, to keep up with, but um, we'll, we'll give it a go anyway. So we'll be back again uh, next Monday. Um, thanks to Lee, thanks to Shane Walsh for coming in, and thanks to our friends at Sure 72 Hour Protection. And um, we'll be back again next Monday. You've been listening to the GAA Hour, brought to you by Sports Joe and Sure 72 Hour Non Stop Protection, tested to the limits. Sure, it won't let you down. <laughs>